Welcome to this video on circular motion. So we're going to start off with a quick recap from level 2 because we're going to need to use some of the same concepts. So in level 2 we learned that when something's getting spun around and around in a circle, so it has circular motion, it's going to have a velocity that's at a tangent to the circle. It's going to carry on moving around and around and at every single point it's always going to have a velocity that is a tangent to the circle. You'll also notice that this velocity is constantly changing and because velocity is changing, because the direction is changing, there must be an acceleration. Because a changing velocity at some time is an acceleration and that acts towards the center. Then we notice that if it has an acceleration, it must have a force because we have the F equals MA formula we must have a force whenever we have an acceleration. And that also would be acting towards the center of the circle. So to sum up the important points from last year, you've got a velocity that acts on a tangent, and it's always changing because the direction is changing, even though the actual speed remains the same. Because of that, you're changing velocity. You have an acceleration towards the center, changing velocity over time. And because of an acceleration, you have a force towards the center. Also, we touched on two formulas last year. One was the centripetal force formula, that force which is always acting towards the center. That's your mass times velocity squared divided by radius. We're going to use that a lot. And the acceleration towards the center. It's actually the same formula except we've replaced F with MA and we've canceled out the M's on both sides. Again, we're going to look at how we do that this year. So if you're not sure on this stuff for any reason, I highly recommend looking at the video on circular motion from level two physics. And now we're gonna build on those ideas for level three. In your level three exams, you might get one of three kinds of circular motion questions. You might get something that orbits, for example, a satellite that's orbiting the earth. You might get something that's swinging vertically up and down like a bucket getting swung around on a rope or you might get a horizontal circle, something like a bus driving around on a circular track. Now they all have different centripetal forces and there's slight differences we need to know about. So each of the circular motion videos is on one of these three things. So in part one, we're just gonna focus on orbiting and the key things you need to know for that. First thing is that gravity is the force that's pulling the orbiting object in towards the center of the circle. It's always gravity when it's orbiting. The second thing you need to know is that the radius of your circle is not just the height of the satellite above the Earth. It's the height of the satellite, this first arrow, plus the radius of the Earth. That's gonna give you your total radius of the circle. The third thing you need to know is that a distance right around the outside is gonna be one orbit, so that's 2 pi r, because 2 pi r is the distance around any kind of circle. It's the circumference. Now, second to last, we have a new formula for gravity. This is the most unique part of orbiting objects. This means the force of gravity, which is also the centripetal force, equals capital G. Now, this is just a number. It's called the gravitation constant. It's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. You plug that number into your formula every time. It's always going to be the same. You've got your mass of the planet or whatever's in the middle, and you've got your mass of whatever's orbiting, in this case a satellite. It's all divided by the total radius squared. So that's your force due to gravity when something is orbiting. As we go through the questions, you'll see that we're going to need to match this formula up with the formula for centripetal force. Because centripetal force in this case is the gravity force, these two formulas are equal to each other. So we might have to make them equal to each other. We also can use F equals MA because these forces are made up of mass times acceleration. Therefore, if we put mass times acceleration in instead of force, because they're the same thing, we can cancel out the common M's on both sides and get our formulas for acceleration. Finally, we need to learn a new word. It's called geostationary. It means that there's an orbiting object, for example, a satellite, and it will stay above the same point in the Earth all the time. So if you're sitting in Auckland, for example, and you look up and there's a satellite there, you look back two hours later, it's always going to be straight above you. So that's geostationary. And there's a few conditions around that. One, it has to be on the equator. So it might not work in Auckland because the equator is the only point on the Earth that goes right around in a full circle. It also has to have a period of orbit. So the time of orbit has to be one day so that when the Earth spins around one day, which is a day, you're going to spin around with it as a satellite. 
And finally, if you're orbiting around at the same rate as the Earth on the equator, you still have to be orbiting in the same direction of the Earth. Otherwise, you're going to go backwards around the wrong way. So you need those conditions to be geostationary. So let's look at some questions about how these ideas of gravity being the force towards the center and our new equation apply in questions. First of all, these questions are all from one previous exam. Here we've got a diagram which shows a satellite orbiting around the Earth. Now we've got the mass of the Earth and the polar radius of the Earth. That just means the radius of the Earth. We need to first of all label this diagram to identify the nature and direction of the forces acting on the satellite. Now we know that there's always a force towards the center, so it's the arrow we draw, and it's always going to be a gravity force when you're talking about orbiting objects. So we write those onto our sheet, and then we're done. That's our answer. Question B. We need to calculate what this force actually is on the 1.08 times 10 to the 3 kg satellite when it's in an orbit that's 20 million meters above the Earth's surface. So let's start off by writing down everything that we know. We know the gravitational constant. That's going to be given to you either in your formula sheet or in the question. You don't have to remember that number. There's the mass of the Earth, which we've been told. There's the radius of the Earth plus the radius of how high it is above the Earth. That's going to give you the total distance from the center of the circle all the way out to the satellite. And here, so we've added together the radius of the Earth, which we've got up here, with the orbit above the Earth. So it gives us our total radius. Finally, we've got the mass of the satellite, which we were told in the question here as well. Now you'll notice that all of these things fit pretty nicely into our gravitational force formula. And because gravitational force is the centripetal force, we're going to figure that one out. So plugging in our numbers of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 for gravitational constant, we have the mass of the Earth multiplied by the mass of the satellite, and all divided by those two distances added together. And then we square them. And when you put that in your calculator, you should get an answer of 610.1 newtons. That's the force on the satellite. In our next question, I've just written down all the extra things we've figured out from the last one. And we need to show that the only stable orbit for this satellite, which has this distance above the Earth, has a period of around 12 hours. So if we start off with our basic formula of velocity equals distance divided by time. That's going to allow us to figure out the time period when we travel one distance around the Earth at a certain speed. So we rearrange for time. But to do that, we need to figure out both the distance and the velocity. So the distance is always going to be 2 pi r, because 2 pi r is the circumference around a circle. It's the distance in a circle. So if we do 2 pi times this radius, and remember, we added those two radiuses together before, then that's going to give us a distance from the center of the Earth of 1.67 times 10 to the 8 meters. Then when we want to find velocity, we've got to look for another formula we know with velocity in it. The only one we know is the centripetal force formula. So it's mass times velocity squared divided by r. If we want to find velocity, we're going to have to rearrange it to get velocity equals, which turns out to be the square root of force times radius over mass. So after you've rearranged that one, then you can plug in your numbers because we know the centripetal force. We just figured it out, 610.1 in the last question. We know the radius, we added those two things together, and we know the mass of the satellite. So if you plug those numbers into your calculator, you'll get a velocity of 3,872 meters per second. So this satellite is hurtling along real fast. So that's good. We've got the distance. We've got the velocity, but remember, we're wanting to show the time. So we plug that distance and that velocity back into our time formula here. So putting all of this into your calculator, you're going to get 43,130 as your time. But as you'll notice, this isn't 12 hours at the moment. It's because we've figured out the time in seconds. So we need to divide this by 60 to get seconds into minutes, which gives us 719 almost minutes. And we divide that by 60 again to get into hours because there's 60 minutes in an hour. And that's going to give us 11.98 hours. Pretty much the 12 hours which we're meant to be finding. So this is a good sign. All right, the next question. This one is worded in a tricky way, but bear with us when we go through it. It says for any body that's orbiting around a primary body, the first body is like the satellite and the primary body is just the thing at the middle. R cubed, that's the radius cubed, is proportional to time squared, the time period. 
We need to show that this is true. And when we're doing it, we need to state the conditions for a stable orbit. And we need to know that the conditions don't depend on the mass of, say, the satellite, whatever's orbiting around, the orbiting object. So first of all, let's just look at the conditions. What do we know about something that's orbiting? We know that the centripetal force must equal the gravity. That's the key thing that we know. Now you could word that slightly differently and focus on acceleration and say, ah, the centripetal acceleration must equal the acceleration due to gravity. But what they're trying to get at is that the force towards the center of the circle is gravitational. Now let's have a look at what all this R cubed proportional to T squared stuff means. So what it means when they ever give you a question like this is you need to get formulas which have R and T in it and somehow get R on one side of the equation and T on the other side of the equation. Let's show how we do that in this case. Now we only have two force formulas and we know that the force of gravity is the centripetal force. That's what we've just written down. So we know that these two formulas are equal and they're really all we're ever going to use for centripetal force. In this case, we've got R in both of these formulas, and there is some time dependency because velocity depends on time, it's distance over time. So if we make these two equations equal, which is quite common to do in your NCEA questions, and then we're gonna simplify this down because we've got masses on both sides, so let's cancel them out to make it a little bit more simple. And you'll also notice that we've got divided by R's on both sides, so we can cancel some of those ones out. So simplified down, We've got that V squared equals G, just that number, times the mass of the Earth divided by radius. So now that we've got this, we need to get something about R on one side, which we're kind of getting at, and velocity has time. So let's split velocity up into distance over time. It was velocity squared, so now it's distance squared divided by time squared. And that all equals the same thing. Now remember what we know about distance. Distance is always 2 pi r. It's the distance around a circle. So we can put 2 pi r in instead of the distance. And just to simplify this down a little bit easier so we get rid of the squared, I'm going to square everything in the brackets. So 2 squared becomes 4. Pi squared is just pi squared and so is r squared. All still divided by t squared. So now we're doing well because we've got r's and we've got t's. So our goal now is to try and get t on one side of the equation and R's on the other side of the equation. So to do that, I'm gonna multiply both sides by T squared. That's gonna get rid of this down the bottom here. So we still have the four pi squared R squared that was up here, and now we have the T squared on the right hand side. This is great. So now, just to make it simpler, I'm gonna rearrange to get R. So we're just gonna divide by both sides by four pi squared, and then we still have this wee r down the bottom, so I'm gonna multiply both sides by r. So that gives us r cubed equals a whole bunch of stuff times t squared. And you'll notice that we now have r cubed, the radius cubed, equals a whole bunch of stuff times t squared, so that means it's proportional to t squared. So if you ever see a question like this, it's probably gonna involve the only formulas you know, and you're just gonna to have to rearrange until you get one thing on one side and the other thing on the other side of your equations. Now for one final question. Here we need to discuss the particular requirements for an orbit that's going to keep this satellite vertically above a certain point on the Earth's surface. So that's like we've got the satellite here and it's sitting straight above that point X. Now we want to keep it above that point X all the time. So even as the Earth rotates around and that point X is on the other side, the satellite's going to still sit right above it. Now this is called being geostationary, and it must orbit in the same direction as the Earth rotates. It also must be on the plane of the equator, because the equator is the only part of the Earth that spins right around in a circle. The poles just kind of rotate around themselves. And finally, it must have an orbital period of just a day. Because it takes the Earth one day to spin around, that's why we call it a day, we must have the satellite spinning around in one day as well to match it. And that is circular motion when objects are orbiting.